Let's open our Bibles to the 119th Psalm. And this evening, uh, we are going to go to the 71st verse and then, and then plow clear through the entire theology of suffering that uh, we began looking at last week and I trust will conclude this week. This week we're looking at how to live for Jesus through the school of suffering. Uh, It's not if we suffer. Suffering, as Job said, that we were born for adversity, like the sparks fly upward. So it's just part of living. But as we open to the 71st verse of the 119th Psalm, we as a nation are in the midst of one of the most challenging times that Americans have faced for over a generation. We've almost had a unbroken generation of uh, little problems here and there, but just amazing economic growth, peace, prosperity, and everything else. But as bad as it might seem right now, you know, we have glimmers, as our president said, but glimmers with 653,000 people losing their job every month aren't glimmers to me. They're glummers, but it doesn't matter. I'm not a politician. But did you know we really have it good Think about how, how bad it was in days past here in America. In fact, I, I just looked in the history books how bad it was in 1917. Did you know what America was like in 1917? It was the last year of World War I. And we were going through hard times. World War I was sapping America's finances. We were kind of like World War II. We were kind of supporting the whole world. It was wearing down our resolve as we were making things and shipping them over there as fast as we could. It was destroying a whole generation of young men. They were the doughboys getting mowed down in the trench warfare over there in Europe. And life was really hard for this nation. And in the midst of all that, There was no government security system. They hadn't invented that until the 30s. You know, the whole social security and welfare and everything else that that we now have. People back then only lived on what they could make and scrape out on their farms or if they had jobs in the cities. Even churches were suffering. If you know anything about that time, it was a very hard time that that post mid World War One and post World War One era. It was very hard, and many churches struggled, so much so that one small church in Kentucky couldn't afford to get enough in their offerings to pay their pastor. And so as we read the 71st verse, I wonder what Pastor Thomas Obadiah Chisholm thought of Psalm 119 in verse 71. Because he got word after preaching one Sunday that because of his failing health, he had a form of of asthma that was... uh, not medically, they didn't know how to treat it back then, Uh, and because of his declining strength because of his asthma, that they wouldn't support him anymore. That was an amazing decision of that little church. And so, after many years of being their pastor, they told him that he needed to earn his own living. And so, he left and went out on his own. And we're going to talk about what he did, because as you know, His testimony is one of my two favorite hymns, and it was his testimony he wrote after they laid him off, after he went out into the cold, cruel world. But for now, let's listen to Ezra's strong, confident words as the Spirit of God guided him to write in the 71st verse something that we all need to ask the Lord to make real in our lives. Psalm 119, verse 71. Let's stand together. And I'm going to read one verse, and we're going to pray, and then we're going to go into the school of suffering and learn from Jesus Christ. Verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Wow. That last part is something you can only learn in affliction. It's better to stick with the Lord through the hard times than to have thousands of gold and silver coins. That hardly computes, does it? But that's the truth of God. In our darkest hours... In our deepest pain, in our hardest times, in our most hopeless situation, that's when God has promised He's closest. 
He is closest to us when he's pruning. He's closest to us when he's refining. He's closest to us when he is revealing himself to us in a fresh way that only comes like we saw last time in the furnace, the fiery furnace, like the three Hebrew young men went through. The Lord walked with them in, in the most clear way when they were in the midst of that furnace. Well, it was in 1917, a 51-year-old pastor, Pastor Chisholm, had to leave the paid vocational ministry for health reasons. Life was hard. Jobs were so scarce that he could not find a place to work to support his family. So he took up a job door to door selling. He did so humming the words of his personal resolve that he had written and his plan for facing physical and emotional afflictions. Remember, those are the two different words. There is a Hebrew word for the physical anguish and there's a Hebrew word for the emotional duress. And, and, and we find that Ezra goes back and forth between these two in the 119th Psalm. But Pastor Chisholm's Remedy for going out into the cold, cruel world, into the harsh realities of his dashed hopes. See, he was 51 years old. He was supposed to be on his career going this way, not out the door. His dashed hopes, his failing health, his declining finances, his limited strength. Well, his testimony is the one. That's the hymn. And I want to look at the middle verse. So just a second. Don't close your Bible, but look at 372, the middle verse tonight, because I want to show you what he was out humming. And I want you to see how closely, how closely this parallels what we're going to see Ezra is teaching in the 119th Psalm. So 372, and we're not going to sing it. We're just going to read the third stanza, because this is what he went out humming as he went out in the dark. And started walking with no car, going door to door to talk to people that were also unemployed, that didn't have any money, and certainly didn't want to buy anything from somebody that was knocking on their door. Do you ever feel that way? I mean, when they come selling their magazines or their little discount cards or their candy bars for a dollar, they have a sticker I'm never going to use on them. You know, it's like, what for? And things haven't changed. But look what he says, verse 3. Okay, let's, let's read that third stanza together. Living for Jesus wherever I am, doing each duty in his holy name, willing to suffer affliction and loss, deeming each trial a part of my cross. Last stanza, living for Jesus through earth's little while, my dearest treasure, the light of his smile. Seeking the lost ones he died to redeem, bringing the weary to find rest in him. And so instead of focusing on his own trouble, he was humming along this. And then I I can just imagine as as he was going up to the first door to, to knock and get it slammed in his face, he was doing that little consecration prayer, the refrain. Can you read that with me, too? I love it. Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior. I give myself to thee, for thou in thine atonement is give thyself from me. I own no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. How can you fail with that kind of attitude? That's amazing. Well, back to the 119th Psalm. Living for Jesus was what Thomas Chisholm learned as he trudged out morning after morning through long, wearying days. God did not take away his troubles. If you ever read a a biographical sketch of him, he never got over his asthma, he never got strong, and he never got rich. Even though he wrote all these hymns. God didn't take away his troubles. But God went through his troubles with Thomas Obadiah Chisholm. God was with him all during his long days, his short nights, his empty cupboards, his non-existent savings. All those troubles were still his. But one thing never changed. God was always faithfully the same. See, sometimes God allows everything around us to change so that we realize that everything else is changeable, but he's not. Everything else will fail us, but he doesn't. 